This week, Zigbee makes the IoT matter, Discord is playing fewer video games, and Apple is trying to bring back the beats. It's Sunday, May 16th, 2021, and this is episode 594 of F5 Live Refreshing Technology, a proud part of the Tech Podcast Network. Wherever you are and however you're accessing our show, whether it be on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Snapchat, through a podcatcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn, or a myriad of other options, uh, through our live stream platforms, livestream.com, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, uh, or of course on our website, pluggitslive.com. Thank you for making us a part of your day. There are two ways that you can do that. The first is... You can join us live Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern by going to f5live.tv slash join us. There you can chat with us in the studio, give us your feedback on the topics as we talk about them. If you're not able to join us live, that's okay. You can always go to plughitslive.com slash subscribe, and there you'll see all of our shows, including F5 Live, Pilch Point, Plug Hits Live Presents, and a whole lot more. And of course, you can find all the different ways that you can watch, listen, and follow along. Hello, Avram. How are you doing? Oh, not bad. Not bad. Uh, <laughs> not bad's a pretty good place uh, to be. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Had a, you know, decent, decent weekend. Wish I got some more done, but I did, uh, I did a bunch of soldering yesterday, which I always, uh, which I always enjoy finding the time, find the time to do working on some, some projects at, at home. Another one with an LED matrix. Nice. Um, you know, uh, so it's, uh, my son and I had the idea that we want to make an Etch-A-Sketch out of it. So like an Etch-A-Sketch like thing out of it. So, you know, you'll have a couple of dials and then you could draw on it or whatever. Okay. Um, in different colors. So the, um, I have to figure out how to code that in circuit Python, uh, cause I'm using, um, an RP2040 board to control it, but, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's always a, always an interesting challenge. So, you know, working on, working on that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, (sighs) obviously lots of, uh, lots of talk also, uh, in our world about, uh, crypto mining, and the latest thing, which is not crypto mining, but crypto farming, which is a yes. new currency called Chia, that is um, that is more dependent on storage than it is on graphics cards and and processing power. But I saw um, I saw the Tom's just, Hardware article yeah. on uh, using a Raspberry Pi for it. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, what you do is you use, I mean, you, you don't actually, like, you create these things called plots, right? Like, And you could create one on a Raspberry Pi in theory, but it would probably take several days. So you create one on a PC, which might take you a few hours, and you create a bunch of plots, and then you put them on a hard drive, and you move that hard drive over to Raspberry Pi, so that, because that the plots have to stay online at all times. And okay. so rather than waste the electricity and uh, system resources of a PC, you take a $35 Raspberry Pi and you connect that. And then you can, um, it's a little weird the way it works. Like every time there's a transaction in Chia, your plot could be called, like it's almost like having a bingo card or something. (laughs) Okay. And if yours is called, then you get a, then you, I guess you get a coin or something. You, you get, you get money and, yours can also get called again. So once you have a bunch of plots hooked up, you never take them off. Even if they have been chosen, they can be chosen again. So okay, uh, it is a little bit of like putting your name in a drawing, but apparently if you have enough plots and enough, uh, the law of averages says that your plots will get hit. Each plot will get hit every few weeks or something like that. Okay. It's obviously it's a different take 
on the concept from what we've been talking about for the last number of years, right? Because normally when we're talking about, about cryptocurrency, we're talking about, you know, processing lots of data, doing it through, through either video cards or specially designed uh, mining hardware. But this is, this is very different and very like the system, the concept behind it is very different, but the, but the yes. value seems to be skyrocketing. Yes, it's another thing that's going up. Of course, very controversial because some people really don't like crypto. Uh, they think it's a waste of resources. Sure. They think it's a waste uh, of electricity. Um, this this crypto is actually greener than Bitcoin sure. or Ethereum because it's not uh, using as much processing power. But I mean, all those criticisms have are, are are valid. But these are things that people are using their resources for um, to 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 make money. And, sure. Uh, so it's it's a big story. Yeah, and so that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't feel like there's anything particularly immoral about it about doing crypto mining. It is frustrating. Obviously, when companies, when small businesses create crypto uh, farms where they just buy up everything, but that's an unfortunate. It's an unfortunate side effect, I guess, of the unfortunate. It's a very, very unfortunate side effect of of the market now. I, and my guess is that a lot of these things that are going up now. I mean, there's been crypto booms before and crypto busts before. So. Sure. It's probably not forever. We remember, we remember Bitcoin going to twenty k, and then almost immediately uh, free falling, and then now we're we've been up to sixty. So yeah, there's there's ups and downs in it. And anytime Elon Musk uh, tweets, it could have a significant impact <laughs> on the market too. So you know, it's not um, what's the word predictable. <laughs> it's definitely a lot of chaos involved but that's that's really interesting it's something that I've been trying to follow and uh, the the resources from Tom's hardware has been a big part of it and uh, speaking of that I I messaged you from a little personal story uh, before we get into the news I messaged you last week I was looking to do a particular thing I don't remember exactly what it was something with a hard drive and I had done a, a search on Bing for for whatever and uh, I ended up on a guide that you had written <laughs> for Tom's guide a number of years or laptop mag. I don't know. It was one or the other a couple yeah, of years it, ago. And I'm like, I Hey, mean, it's Avram. I know him. My greatest hits just keep coming up. <laughs> now only people will read the new articles. Yeah. Well, you know, I, our, our most watched videos, except for this week, um, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, are still, a year and a half old. So, you know, I understand. Um, speaking of new videos, uh, this past week, we had the opportunity through our First Looks brand to interview, um, to have one of our uh, student partners interview uh, Dean Kamen, who is in our world, the founder of First, but is also the creator of the technology that is the Segway as well as the Coca-Cola freestyle machine. So in one way or another, he has probably affected, uh, <laughs> affected your life. Uh, he's also got, I mean, he's got all kinds of tech out there. Um, but that video is available on all of our, on all of our uh, social media for first looks. Uh, it's on our YouTube channel and of course on the website. So definitely check that out. And this week, Thursday night, uh, Danielle and myself will get an opportunity to do another conversation with Dean Kamen, where we will be talking about life after first and how uh, first students and uh, other high school graduates can take um, the information, the, the things that they've learned, like, you know, uh, Avram and his son doing robotic stuff at home and how they can take all of that knowledge and use that to, uh, to get out into the working world in those fields. So that's going to be a fantastic conversation as well. That one will be live uh, Thursday night, I think at 6 p.m. Uh, definitely check the First Looks uh, Facebook page or our YouTube channel to find out the exact time once it's scheduled. 
uh, which should be done tonight. So we're really excited about that one. We got to interview Dr. Flowers uh, about a year before he passed away. And so uh, now we get to talk to the other founder first. So that's super cool. Very excited about that. He's one of the nicest and smartest people I've ever interacted with. So uh, I really look forward to that. And you should definitely check it out. Um, but for now, let's get down to some news. This week's Nifty Gifties and F5 Live is proudly powered by the Microsoft Store. Whether you're looking for a new laptop, a tablet, uh, desperately seeking a new Xbox, uh, some games, and a whole lot more, you can find them all at the Microsoft Store. And of course, remember that current students, faculty, parents, and active military can all save up to 10% on almost everything. And to find out about that, and to browse all the products that are available, you can go to f5live.tv slash Microsoft. So obviously we talk in, in the uh, tech space a lot about the Internet of Things. Um, some people refer to it more as the smart home. Uh, Kim Kelly, who's the, the CEO of Hampton Products, has a really nice uh, delineator that I like between connected products and smart products, smart ones make decisions on their own, connected, you tell them what to do. And I like that line. Either way, there are a lot of ecosystems, right? You might be using uh, the Samsung smart things, or you might be within um, the, the Apple home kit, or maybe you're using product from Z-Wave or Zigbee, there's lots of ways that these things can connect. And then, of course, there's you know Monster behind me that runs in a Wi-Fi, which makes it a little bit more universal. Um, but the problem, of course, is what if you have you know, products from a couple of companies and you want them to interact? Will they? Won't they? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple of exceptions. The Z-Wave Alliance and the Zigbee Alliance um, have both you know created ecosystems in which... There's a standard communication, and the idea is that, and you may not have ever heard those. Z-Wave you may have because they've been partners of ours for a while, but Zigbee you may not have heard of, um, and the idea is it's a, it's a communication, right, Abram? It's like a, it's a single wireless frequency and communication where they can talk to each other. They can even uh, relay for each other, which is one of the things I like, uh, Zigbee is important enough that it is on Mars right now. If you've seen any of the photos and video of the little helicopter that NASA is flying around Mars, that is communicating back to uh, Perseverance using Zigbee. So I think, I think one thing that's interesting is people may be wondering why would you want one of these, why would you want a device to use one of these rather than more popular standards like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth? Uh, and the answers seem to be power. They use a lot less. They use a lot less power because they're op because they don't need to transfer as much data. Sure. And the fact that there's they don't have to all send the data back to a central hub like your router. They can kind of pass it through each other. Mm -hmm. um, and that that has been like the big the big focus of you know the the two major alliances. Uh, has been creating that ecosystem that allows for, you know, smaller data packets, less power consumption, things like that. But the the Zigbee Alliance made a change this week in expanding its name. It is no longer the Zigbee Alliance. It is now the Connectivity Standards Alliance because under this organization, there are now um, a number of standards, Zigbee being one of them. But the goal is to allow cross ecosystem uh, compatibility. So if you've got a product like the lights running on Wi-Fi and something else that's running on, on Zigbee, the idea would be that, you know, there would be a way it might be with Zigbee since it's a special uh, frequency, it might be, you know, a little hub or something, but the, 
ability to allow a Samsung SmartThings device to be able to turn on a uh, Philips Hue light bulb um, and then, I don't know, set off an alarm from uh, Energizer Smart, uh, Energizer Connect, uh, all using different technologies. And I think that is a, a great expansion on on their goal, right? Because their goal was for interoperability. And so to be able to expand that out beyond ecosystem, I think is a great uh, a great idea. And they've got a lot of people on board with this. Amazon, Apple, Google, IKEA, and Samsung Smart Things are all on board. And NXP that makes a lot of the chips for smart devices is on board too. So we might actually see this one come together. Uh, of course, because nobody likes, they know that these sorts of competing standards are very bad for consumers, which means they're very bad for sales. Mm -hmm. If people have to think like, it's very complicated. Do I have a Zigbee or a Z-Wave? Oh, do I want to get other devices that use Zigbee when I have another one that's Z-Wave and another one that's Wi-Fi? It right. ought to be seamless to the user. It really ought to be, uh, especially the type of things that they're selling. These are not so, smart home stuff is not supposed to be for geeks only. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be, hey, everybody can use this. Every it, We want to make it easy. Right. So when you've got all different standards, that doesn't make it easy. Right. So they have to work it out. It's been too long. For sure. And, you know, we, we've seen this with other standards in the past. You know, the most... The most recent and most obvious version that I can think of, of course, was wireless charging. Uh, Samsung had their standard mm -hmm. that Philips or Panasonic or somebody was behind. And on the other side, you had Qi. Um, and Samsung at some point said, all right, we're out. <laughs> and they moved over to Qi, um, thankfully. But they did put out... Is out? What's that? Like... Do you see this as as a we're out? Because what happened with Qi is they didn't come to some compromise. Everybody just now uses Qi. Well, Samsung actually put both coils in their devices for a while. Uh, they actually from the from the Galaxy S like five through nine or something. They had both a Qi charging coil and the Samsung charging coil. There was an attempt at trying to be cross market uh, when Apple joined. Uh, the wireless power consortium, that was the end of Samsung attempting to, to keep both operational. But the, the idea, you know, what the thing that Samsung was trying to do was to give both choices. Um, and in the end, right. in the end, one of them didn't work, uh, as a, as a market solution because there was so much power behind Qi, which is part of the reason why both the Zigbee Alliance and the Z-Wave Alliance have been so successful and have so many members is because uh, because they're solving, trying to solve that market that market problem. I don't think that we're going to see standards necessarily go away because there are benefits to each, right? Like we said with Zigbee, there's less power. There's the ability to relay, so you don't even have to push data as far. Um, but the thing that I like about what they're up to is it's not just interoperability. They're putting on top of it um, a standard for setup. So uh, like a, a very specific set of things for setup that involves Bluetooth LE for getting started and then transitioning over to whatever the technology is. It's a really like a very nice set of steps that they're putting together. So it doesn't matter what you're setting up. Theoretically, um, your process should be identical or at least visually similar, which I think is a great part of it because, you know, so many of the videos that we've done on products as a response on, on smart and connected home products has been, I don't understand how to set this up. <laughs> um, obviously, we started with the, the monster illuminescence and then moved into the smart stuff. Um, and both of them have quirks <laughs> to setting them up. So if all of them worked the same, I think it would be better, significantly better for consumers. 
And that's, yeah, that's I one mean, of the big it, promises. It's too hard. It's too hard right now. Now, as a tech journalist, that's good for me because uh, if things are too difficult, then we can help people. Uh, although we don't do a lot of smart home. I don't do a lot of smart home personally, but uh, I think for the consumer, you want it to be easy. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we've seen some companies try to to build easier setups. I mean, there was there was a company we interviewed at CES a couple of years ago who who had some thing built in that you just like tapped it to your smart hub to your hub and it was off and running some sort of nfc or rfid thing but that meant being within a closed ecosystem which of course is the problem that that the former z way zigbee alliance now the connectivity standards alliance is trying to solve i think it's i think it's only better for consumers so good on them I'm glad that they've got some high-profile members. Hopefully, we'll see uh, some of the other. You know, you've got most of your first tier because uh, in Zigbee you've got Philips Hue, which is you know your big lighting brand because it runs on Zigbee. Um, so you've got a lot of your big names now. If we can start getting the the middle tier, the the Walmart brands uh, on board as well, I think we'll be in really good shape. So fingers crossed on all of that. This week's Pilch Point with Abram Pilch is proudly powered by PureVPN. The best way to protect your uh, privacy online is with PureVPN. You can hide your online activities, say goodbye to regional restrictions, and improve your streaming quality, plus, uh, it's available for almost all of your devices, and you can get a special price right now by going to pilchpoint.live slash purevpn. All right, so we talked about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago. We teased <laughs> we teased the idea out, but uh, Tom's Hardware's birthday is right around the corner. Well, it's pretty much now, right? I mean, <laughs> we... The first, uh, so our website, Tom's Harbor, went live in spring of 1996. We, now, this may come as a shock to you, but nobody who currently works there was there in 1996. In fact, originally, it was just run by one person, the founder, Thomas Pass, who hasn't been with the website in since 2005 or so, maybe even before that, but that's the last uh, record I think we have of him. Uh, working for the site. So anyway, we don't have the exact date that it went live because uh, that's not archived on our site. The earliest article we can find is July 1996, but we've seen some evidence that it was April. So, you know, we're splitting the difference. Uh, we're going to say, uh, we're going to, we're going to publish an article soon about our 25th anniversary, but really it's not about our 25th anniversary because Honestly, as great a website as we are, uh, nobody wants to read about our life. No one wants to read about, you know, what, what, what we do every day. They want to read about the technology, right? So we, uh, so I took this opportunity to compare a, the best technology of that you could get in 1996 to what is top of the line today across a lot of different categories and what might surprise you is how similar some of it is so how little has changed and then in some cases how much has changed so for example the best phone you could get the top of the line in 1996 scott can you guess what that might have been uh microtac startac uh startac yes Yes. we talked about that it was in the transition point uh the the star tag came out just just in that window. Yes, so star tag uh, that was the top phone. Obviously, uh, no internet on that. The original star tags could not re- could not send text messages, only receive them. Now, obviously, uh, there was actually an attempt at a smartphone before that, the Simon Personal Communicator by IBM. In 1994, but that wasn't really a mainstream product. Today, top of the line is, I mean, you can kind of take your pick. 
I'll go with the Galaxy S21 Ultra 5G, which is uh, 12, 1249 now. Obviously has a 6.9 inch OLED display, dual cameras that shoot 8K video, uh, 11 hours of active use. Uh, obviously, uh, when the star tack lasted 60 minutes or less of talk time. So um, obviously big change in phones with the emergence of smartphones and, and the, the quality stuff that they have, like really great cameras. Of now, course. Of course, with the StarTac, you did have that removable battery, which is something that you and I have lamented a number of times. Yeah. Is the loss that, of that. That is sad, but that's sad. But if you only have 60 minutes of talk time, you would need to have like, what do you call those things that, that like Chewbacca wears or whatever, or other people wear where they have like their little gun shells? Yeah. yeah. A bandolero or something. Something like that. You know, you just need a bandolero of batteries for 60 minutes of talk time. You'd have to be like, just taking it out and putting it in. We, we sold a, uh, yeah. a battery for them that you could put double A's in. Ah, there <laughs> you go. So there was a lot of innovation there too, because the, yeah. the antenna kept coming out, right? And you could get replacement antennas. We sold those too. The, uh, I, I, by the way, did have a star tack. I didn't get the, I, I was a little later to the market than that. I think the one I got was like 90, 1999 or 2000, but, uh, um, so for the monitors, obviously that's been a huge change. One of the biggest changes besides phones has been monitors. Uh, I mean, the thing that is similar is we still use monitors, but I guess that was predictable. Uh, but the, uh, best monitor that you could get, uh, by, you know, that I've seen by research or, or one of the best was in 96 was the Sony Multiscan. 20 SE2 that was 1999 and for that you had a 21 inch monitor uh with a maximum resolution of 1600 by 1200 and it weighed 66 pounds and was 19 inches deep uh, this desk now I'm really aging myself here this desk that I'm sitting at here I have had this desk since uh, about 1997 <laughs> it's almost as long and i bought it because i wanted a desk that was deep enough to hold a large screen monitor at the time uh, so what what is top of the line today well if for within reason the top of the line is probably the lg 27 gn 950 which is 1160 and gives you 4K gaming at 144 Hertz uh, with free sync or G-Sync support. And that weighs only 16.9 pounds and is just 2.1 inches thick. Now, if money is no object to you whatsoever, then I would suggest the top of the line is the Alienware AW5520QF. Say that three times fast. And that is a 55 inch OLED panel, OLED screen that operates at 120 Hertz. Uh, and that is a little big, it's 59 pounds, uh, and, but it's still only 3.1 inches thick and it's $3,000. So actually more than top of the line was the 96, but uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, the high end monitors are a thousand dollars or less. and you can get a really good monitor for, as we've talked about, under $300. Now, what about this, the mouse? Uh, so what was the top mouse, the top of the line mouse in 1996, Scott, do you think? Oh, that is a <laughs> 1996. That's probably before the, it's definitely a ball mouse at that point, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's before the the Microsoft ergonomic mouse almost certainly. I don't know. Mm. Something Logitechy? If top the the mouse that came out in that fall was the Intel mouse. Okay. The first Intel mouse. Okay. But it was the Intel mouse the first Intel mouse had the curved shape, uh, but it was a ball it was a ball mouse. They didn't add the optical sensor for a couple of years later. 
and, but it was the mouse that popularized the scroll wheel. Yeah. Before that, there had been like a couple of, I think there had been one or two uh, off-brand, not well-known mice that had scroll wheels, but Microsoft took the scroll wheel mainstream. Now, you could say that you could say that a lot, a lot has changed in mice, and a lot has stayed, but a lot has stayed the same. You're still using a mouse, and you're still moving around the desktop the same way. So it hasn't. The fundamental paradigm is the same, but the the ball has been replaced by a sensor. There are more buttons, uh, and you can do high speed, and you can do competent, and you can do wireless really well. Mm. So. It's, I would say, I say that that's more evolutionary than revolutionary. Yeah. Now, skipping ahead to some of the other things that are on my list of 12 items here, uh, we have some components as well. So what do you think the fastest processor was in 1996? We had this conversation. I'm trying to remember what it was. I'm thinking that it was a uh, speed. What megahertz speed do you think it was in 96? Let's say 66 or 125. No, 200, 200. Okay. 200. Yes. Two, 200. So and what proc was that? Not, I mean, that was the Intel. There was an Intel Pentium P 54 C model that, that the top, top, megahertz was 200. A lot of people were on 66 or I think 133 and 166 were more common, mm -hmm. but um, two, 200 was the bleeding edge. Okay. Um, today, of course, we could argue about which one, which one to choose because uh, there was an embarrassment of riches, but I'll go with the Ryzen 9 5950X. Uh, I mean, obviously they're high end desktop processors and server processors that do more, but for an end user perspective, the Ry AMD Ryzen 9 5950X uh, runs around five gigahertz, has 16 cores and 32 threads. So that's, you know, really good. And that's about $800. Uh, so uh, how much RAM do you think was top of the line in 1996. Let's see. Uh, let's go for, oh, I'm going to sound, I'm going to make a guess and I'm going to sound stupid, I bet. Uh, let's go with 8 meg. So top of the line was 64 meg. Okay. Um, in fact, you could sort of say that 1996 the amount of RAM that the amounts of RAM are similar to today if you exchange gigabytes for megabytes. You okay. Know, low, you know, really low end would be eight megabytes. Mid range would be 16. High end would be 32. And 64 would be like people who are video editors type of people. So um, similar to today, except except a thousand times more today exactly a thousand times more that's crazy right? um so uh and it was edo ram which uh, operated at a much uh, much slower pace than uh ddr4 and this year we're going to be at, at ddr5 um so you know we also have on my list here storage drive Graphics card, case and power supply. Uh, case and power supply have changed very little. I was going to say, you know, that's that, one that sounds like a category that's that's going to be uh, disappointingly evolutionary. <laughs> Just yeah, very very little. I mean, we still use ATX. So ATX came out around ninety five ninety six, so it was new then, and we still use ATX style cases. Uh, and ATX style power supplies, although with more wattage and more, more, more dedicated lines for the, for the graphics card and the CPU. And, and, uh, but, you know, modular capabilities and all kinds of weird little add-ons, but, but still pretty stand, pretty, pretty static. 
and the price and the the price was about similar about 60 to 90 dollars would get you 230 to 250 watts um, i mean today people still use 400 500 watts a lot so it's not i mean i guess that's a double but i mean there are people who use less so actually you know the the world of power supplies is not it's not changed that dramatically we do have some other smaller form factors now we have lights um yes <laughs> um but i mean finally and i'll leave the rest of this to folks to read when this article goes up uh on saturday uh we have connectivity and networking uh the fastest what was the fastest uh speed you could get connect to the internet at in 1996. Oh, I, I imagine we're talking consumer. Yes. Yes. Okay. Consumer. Um, I, I was, uh, T3. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. Um, uh, 54. 33, six. Really? We weren't even there yet. Six had not, had not come out yet. So, that um that tells you something and 56 i just discarded 236 30 about two weeks ago yes um and that was really top of the line i think a lot of people were still on 28 or um 14.4 so yeah or if you wanted to connect your devices to each other at home or in the office 100 base t internet was ethernet 100 base t ethernet was the was the standard uh, obviously today we've got many more ways to get online besides well nobody uses dial up anymore very few people we, have, we actually uh, did a six we actually did a story on gnc we can review a couple of weeks ago uh there are still if i remember correctly aol still has thirty eight thousand uh dial up customers 38,000. Yeah. At this point, which is, you would think that they which would is stop 40, the business. It would not yeah, be worth it. I was to say, which is 40,000 more than I was expecting. I, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it seems like I mean, there would be less really than zero. No, yeah. It's, I mean, cause I don't know. It probably doesn't even pay, make business sense to keep providing that service. Well, uh, it's somebody else's problem now. Even, yeah. Um, so, you know, Wi-Fi six is obviously the new standard six E, um, six, well, six and six E Yeah. six E is they're just coming out with some six E routers right now. Um, I don't think there's actually anything with native six E in like your laptop or anything mm -hmm. like that. Nope. And six and six E are actually the same speeds. It's just six E will give you, I think, better connectivity, better connectivity something uh, like ten, that they uh, were obviously... they were on the show during ces um so if people want more information uh, our ces coverage has it yeah i mean the theoretical maximum of both is 9.6 gigabit per second uh but obviously you'd be better off with 60 uh 10 10 gigabit ethernet is common and 5g 5g wireless so even if you can't get a wire to your home, 5G wireless seems like if you live anywhere with cell reception, you'd be better off with 4G, 5G, or even 3G over do it, over using the dial-up. Uh, but Indeed. we have uh, we have some more information about some of the other things that have changed in the last changed or changed not that much in the last 25 years. And I encourage people to check out the article when we send it live on next Saturday. I love these types of things, especially when, when you're running point on them, because they're always, there's always a surprise in it, even though I have boxes of these components around, which is weird, but still, uh, I, I don't remember the exact details of that time. And it's, yeah, it's really I mean, interesting to hear, you know, Ram is literally a thousand x different yeah it's exactly it's like a thousand exactly a thousand that's now, bonkers the main my i just just 
just full disclosure, my main method for researching this, like what was common at the time, I mean, I was there, but you know, I don't remember exactly what happened. Sure. <laughs> exactly what everything was, you know, the price of is that uh, books.google.com has a lot of old computer magazines. So mm -hmm. if you leaf through, they have a specifically, they have a lot of old PC mag issues. So while there have been some stories that people have done on, you know, the history of some of these products, you know, to look back at exact, to look back at what like RAM was selling for and what configurations of RAM you could get at the time, I just looked through some old issues of PC mag and I was looking at all the ads that they had, which would tell you like, okay, this is how much it cost. Th these are the different, you know, the highest end config has 64 Mac. So that's, you know, that information is out there and you can go and, and see what just reading the ads is actually more informative than reading the articles. Yeah. That's, that's super interesting. That's a, it's a great way of, of looking for it. I look forward to seeing the article. It, uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, storage sounds like it's going to be a fun one to to read about, and so are video cards. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> zip drives. Ah, oh, I've got several of them. Uh, one of them I can see from where I'm sitting. Uh, they were a great transitional technology, even though I, I loved zip drives. I know there's there's an article that goes around on Facebook from time to time, uh, dumping on them, and I'm like, no, incorrect. This person was not alive. <laughs> And in a place yeah. where they needed oh, like storage in that time. Because uh. I was doing media for a church. And the zip drive is the thing that made it so that we could easily have, like, big PowerPoint presentations and move them between rooms. Couldn't have done it. There was no real networking at the time. So, <laughs> thank goodness for zip drives. <laughs> anyway, I look forward to this. And as always, Avram, I look forward to what we talk about next. This week's Extra Life on F5 Live is proudly powered by Loot Crate. Whether you're a gamer, an anime fan, or a pop culture aficionado, Loot Crate has got a crate for you. They curate a bundle of collectibles, apparel, figures, and more that you can't find anywhere else, and crates get delivered to your door. It's like getting an awesome birthday present from a friend every single month. And to learn more about the crates that are available, you can go to f5live.tv slash new to crate um obviously we've talked a lot about the epic game store because they have uh popped up to be the david to the goliath that is the steam game store because when it comes to pc gaming there is no denying that steam owns the market uh, epic wants a piece of it but Steam owns the market, and we all know that. Um, and they tried to get into, quote-unquote, console gaming at one point in the past with their Steam machines, which were, what's the word? A disaster. Um, most of the manufacturers ended up throwing Windows uh, 8 or 10 on them. I don't remember exactly what year it was, but they put Windows on them and shipped them as PCs and just moved on with their days because the OS never really hit the market. But there's also, we also know that the console market is a lucrative place for games. And uh, so during a panel at an event in New Zealand, Gabe Newell, who is uh, the CEO of, uh, of Valve that runs Steam, was asked about uh, Steam on consoles. And his response was surprising he said you will have a better idea of that by the end of the year and that's it that's all we were given uh there's so much that that could mean right avram could hopefully they're not going to try and do steam machines or something like it again but perhaps 
they're going to partner with somebody to offer an alternate game store, but that doesn't seem realistic either. Maybe we're going to see back catalog stuff. Uh, I think your mic might be muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen with because I don't think that the companies will allow an alternate yeah. store. I can't imagine. I so think Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo doing that. Right. And so because while this generation of consoles does sell for higher than it costs to manufacture, unlike the last two generations where we know that at launch both Microsoft and Sony were losing money on the hardware. Um, that's not the case this generation, but it's still, you know, small potatoes compared to what's available uh, in the, in the actual marketplace. Um, so that you're right. I can't imagine that being the case. So is valve bringing some non console games to P, or non console games to consoles? Are we seeing refreshes? What what could he possibly I mean, be talking about? It would, so I think there's a couple of things. It would certainly behoove them to bring some of their game, some of the games that they own to to consoles because you know more more money. But I think another possibility is is could they put Steam Link in the stores so that you could run steam link from your xbox or playstation that's interesting i hadn't considered that okay i mean i mean you can we have a story about this sometimes i worry you can run steam link on a raspberry pi so it doesn't require much in the way of resources so it would be very easy to do so you have your you know your pc in the you know in your home office living room whatever and you want to play on the big screen in, in, the, in the living room, uh, this, you know, maybe you can do it through your Xbox now. Wow. And we know, we know that, that even though Gabe had some nasty things to say about Windows 8, um, we know that, that Valve and, and Microsoft have had a, a long running partnership, especially on the Xbox, because, you know, a lot of the, um, the the portal stuff came to came to Xbox when it was originally a PC game and things like that. So, you know, they've got a relationship. I I could see it happening. It's an interesting idea. I'd like to see it happen. Yeah. If that's not what the uh, I mean, what you're talking about, Gabe, uh, it should be. Let's figure that one out too. <laughs> now the question is: Does something like that? Is something like that, is either of these scenarios bad for PC gaming as a whole? If they right. take things that were PC exclusive and bring them to consoles, is that bad for PC? And if they make it too easy to play on your console, maybe you start to think, well, why don't I just use my console all the time? Perhaps. I do like, and you know, it's one of the reasons why I like Game Pass, um, is that uh, with Game Pass Ultimate, I can literally play the, ga the game anywhere even if it's a console game i can stream it off console uh, onto a, a computer or a phone or something so i it's a thing that makes me use the titles in more places um but is it bad for pc gaming probably not because you're i mean you've still got to have the pc side that's in charge, right? Because that's the thing that's actually doing the work, if I understand Steam Link correctly. So you'd still have you'd still have to have a, a fairly powerful PC. And a lot of people would only use it for, you know, short term stuff. Yeah. You know, PC gamers are PC gamers. I think we all know that. There, <laughs> yes. uh, there's there's a lot of fight infighting in that community. <laughs> So PC gamers tend to look down on console gamers. So I don't, I don't know. It's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff at stake here. It's all very interesting. And I had not considered it at all. Well, I mean, it would be easy enough for them to do. It would certainly be a convenience that people like. So. Interesting. Well, he says you will have a better idea by the end of the year. 
However, in my experience, uh, if an announcement of any uh, importance in the gaming space is going to be made, it's probably going to be made at E3. Um, and it, again, because of that relationship, it would not be the first time that Valve showed up at a Microsoft event. Um, I think we all remember uh, Gladys twisting down out of the ceiling at the Xbox press conference to announce Still Alive. Um, so uh, it wouldn't be the first time that Valve just showed up at a Microsoft event to announce a new partnership. So E3 seems like a logical place to make an announcement like that, but they may not be ready to make it, so they might do it solo later on. Valve is known for just saying things one day <laughs> with no warning. So there's no telling, uh, but worst case scenario, we've only got a couple of months to wait to find out. Best case scenario, we find out in just a couple of weeks. This week's news from the Tubes and F5 Live is proudly powered by Malware Bytes. Whether you use a PC, a Mac, or a mobile device, Malware Bytes Premium is Malware Bytes' strongest protection ever. It fights threats that traditional antivirus software can't stop. Uh, Malware Bytes Premium actively blocks threats like worms, rogues, dialers, trojans, and a whole lot more. And you can use your computer and mobile device with confidence and peace of mind. To learn more and to get a special price, Go to f5live.tv slash malwarebytes. One space that we have not quite been able to figure out the popularity of, uh, and we talk about it, our confusion over it a lot, right, Avram, is the chat space. Why every couple of months a new chat service pops up and becomes popular uh, when it doesn't offer seemingly anything different from AOL Instant Messenger in 1996. is 1996, ICQ was founded. I just looked it up. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so it doesn't offer much more than what ICQ offered in 1996. Um, but they pop up, they make a big deal. Um, sometimes they're, they fall into a very narrow category Sometimes they're wide, like Slack or Teams, and sometimes they make a transition. Uh, and this week, Discord announced that their transition that they had discussed a year ago has uh, matured, and that instead of being a gaming-centric community, they wanted to be the place for all communities. Uh, they have changed their logo, which is interesting because the word mark now looks a little bit like the Fortnite logo, uh, which makes it feel more gaming and not less. And uh, their icon, Clyde, um, has always had these really thin like wings next to its head that have gotten more solid and he looks more like an Xbox one controller than ever, which is weird as part of this brand change for we're all, in, we're more inclusive to have your logo look more video gamey, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> their goal is to appeal to everybody. They've gotten rid of all the dark colors. They have, uh, they've more solidified the, blurple color that they use as their primary uh, brand. They've added blue and green and pink and red and yellow into their brand uh, image to add some color into the app because the app I you've you've used Discord, right, Avram? It's very dark. Yes, yes. And uh, and it I doesn't feel Discord. that way anymore, which I like. It doesn't oh, feel I'm closed in. I will tell you that I've actually used Discord on things that are not exactly gaming either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so it's it's been used for that for a while. For example, if you're in the maker community, there was there is a Pimeroni 
Discord where you can go and it's like forums, but it's on Discord. Uh, so you can talk to the people at Pimeroni and other users about Pimeroni products, which if you don't know what those are, those are uh, maker accessories for Raspberry Pi and other boards. So uh, the there's one for um, there's there's one for surrogate TV has a discord surrogate TV. I mean, I guess you could call it gaming. They are a site where you can go on and you can uh, play games remotely that exist in real life. So you can, they have a pinball machine in their office and you can play it on the web, but, uh, and they have like uh, Mario Kart live in their office and you can play it on the web. Uh, um, really cool, really cool guys. But there's a, there's a lot, what people discuss in the discord is not like, Hey, I'm playing this game now. It's usually like, oh, hey, how do I log into this game? Or they have a lot of API stuff that you can use to kind of create these sorts of games at home uh, and use their server. So it's really a, you know, tech community, not a gaming community, I, I think. So yeah, Discord is used for a lot of this stuff. The uh, And I guess it's easier to add, it seems easier to add multiple discords than to add multiple slacks. Although I have multiple slacks, but as do I, um, so, but honestly, I'm, I don't use discord much. I log off of it because I don't want to have like a million different things alerting me. And nothing that I'm on, nothing that I'm signed up for in Discord is that important to me that I have to get the information from it right away. Uh, Slack, on the other hand, I use for my job. Right. So I have that open all the time. So do we need both of these? No. <laughs> I mean, and then on top of it, um, we've also got Teams, right? Which a lot yes. of people use for work. I've got. I've got both Teams and Slack open all day because client and whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, and, and let's not forget that there's Google Google Meet. Mm -hmm. And I have, even though I use it, I've lost track of what Google Chat is called now. Is it Google Chat? Is it Google Meet? Is it Google... Like it's in my Gmail and I'm not really even sure what it's called at this point. Yeah. Uh, good, good branding. Cause they keep yeah. changing the name of exactly. Google chat. Good. Right. I mean, good job. I see chat. Good, good job. Google. I, I see chat in my Gmail like window. So is it called Google chat again? For a while they were trying to call it something else. Right. Ugh, because they, there was, I can't keep there track. was hangouts and there's been all kinds of, Right. Google's Hangouts. Google's communication chat, strategy. Me. Google's communication strategy is as confused as the overall internet's communication strategy, right? There's so many different ways to communicate on the internet. And then there are so many ways to communicate inside of Google. Yeah. And they keep changing them too. Right. Yeah. So, or the name of them anyway. So, ah, <sighs> And anyway, yes, there's too many of these things. But if I were Discord, I guess I would do this because why not? And people like are already no... there, and right, which was your yeah. point. People are already using it for non-gaming content. So it makes sense that they would start to lean into that. And rather than continuing down this, we're a, we're a gaming service, you know, People want to use it for more than gaming, so embrace that. Make it feel less like a gaming place that you're that you're uh, what if trying to push other people out of. I just thought of something. I don't know if this is uh -oh. over the top to, to, to think, but what if Discord is the new forums? Right? A lot of websites a lot of websites still have their own forum software. We do at Tom's Hardware. Um, that people go into the web to use and they, and obviously Reddit has become very, very powerful dominant in the, you know, it's, web forum space. It's the, the internet's forum. Right. Um, what if, what if for some of these sites, I mean, Pimeroni has both surrogate might have both. Uh, but what if Discord was really becoming that 
It was the forums for, for different things. I mean, you don't have to uh, sign up for different mm -hmm. um, stuff. So maybe, I don't know, maybe there's some, some benefit to it because it's real time. It gives you good alerts, uh, things, things like that. I also haven't really had a chance to mess with it, but it's like the audio and video chat better in discord than it is in Slack because in Slack, it's not so great. Oh yeah. I hate the audio in Slack. I don't know. I, I don't really use discord though. You have given me a reason to explore a little bit more with it. Um, cause that, that idea is interesting. Um, yeah. And I've also heard, you know, some companies of some companies using discord the way that, uh, people use companies use Slack. Right. So, uh, to talk to internal people and partners and things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, why not? I guess, except that for the marketplace perspective, this is, this could be a little annoying, but on the other hand, discord is, I think to set up free. I mean, it's certainly free to certainly free to log in. Right. I don't know if it's free to start a community. I think, I think it is. So, there, you know, it's, I think a lower bar to entry than something like teams, which yeah. really requires you to invest mm -hmm. in Microsoft. Right. And which a lot so, of, which a lot of enterprises yeah. already are, which is part of the reason why yes. we've seen such a heavy transition to teams. Um, but we, there's still a lot of Slack usage. Like I said, I've got both open all day. I mean, but this reminds me a little bit of Twitch, right? Didn't Twitch say at some point, Hey, good news. We're not just, we're not just game streaming yeah. anymore. Yeah. We're just in TV again, but, <laughs> but I don't think you see a ton of non gaming popular streams on Twitch. So, you know, they still have that DNA and it's, I don't think it's easy right. for them to shake that reputation. And, and that's the thing that, that I find interesting about this is, Will they be able to, to, to do that? Will they be able to make it feel more welcoming for non-gaming people? I mean, including changing the logo to look more gaming, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, that seems clueless to me. I think they actually maybe didn't. I think they maybe think that this looks less gaming. <laughs> maybe, except that the tell me that logo font doesn't look almost exactly like it the Fortnite, like Fortnite. So the old one, uh, I've not been, you know, keeping, uh, keeping up with all of Discord's uh, branding changes, but the old one, looking up the old one, it looks more like a high tech font. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were saying, Oh, I bet you there was someone there who's like, Hey, this looks geeky. This looks like, you know, this looks like someone who watches the sci-fi channel. Uh -huh. Mind you, the sci-fi channel isn't even that geeky. Right. But anyway, they uh, we need this to look more friendly and approachable. And so they like, went with something more playful. Uh, right. So this is playful, friendly, and approachable. But meanwhile, it also looks like a game. <laughs> but I think that was probably... that was. I'm guessing that was probably the corporate discussion. Like, hey, yeah. you know, we don't want this to look... Um, to look to to look too geeky so make it look friendly and and so it looks like fortnite <laughs> well you can't win. yeah uh, I know. you know <laughs> one thing one thing i would like to say about this whole gaming non-gaming bifurcation is i'm i'm a little tired of it mm -hmm. like we we have like this idea that if you're gonna be for business the way to do it is to like change the font or change the color of something. And then like, look, we're for business now because, and we see this constantly in the hardware world, constantly. Mm -hmm. Like for example, MSI laptops, uh, MSI has their business line of laptops, right? And a lot of them are extremely similar to the gaming ones, but they've changed the colors of them and they've taken away some like features like RGB. And so they can say, Hey, this is this is conservative. It's okay for an office because mm -hmm. uh, look, the dragon logo on the back is not red but white. Um, <laughs> so, the, I mean, that's effectively what they're saying. I know. And 
and I, I have seen this time and again where companies have told me either on or off the record that like, hey, you know, we made we had to come out with this line because even though it has the exact same features as a consumer laptop or a consumer device, uh, it has to be like black or gray or maybe white. It has to be like very conservative looking. We have to take away things that look gamer like uh, to to make it fit in an office. And honestly, if someone is buying their own laptop and they're bringing it to the office, I don't know. I, do people care? In 2021, do people really care? Are you going to like not get the job or be fired or looked down upon if you are an IT programmer or an IT manager and you're caught bringing an Alienware laptop with you well, that has the big Alienware logo on it? Well, certainly not. A programmer. In fact, uh, my company used to issue them. I used to issue Alienwares as as the developer laptop. <laughs> I mean, why why not? If it's a good if it's a good system, it's a good system. Exactly. Right? Like being being afraid so, of an alien head on the back of the laptop versus you know Dell's Michael Dell's last name. It, doesn't make any sense yeah, to me. I mean, it just, it just, just like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I've worked in places that are less, like, less buttoned down. Stuffy. Than that, but I don't know. It's less stuffy. But if there, how many people are there really who are still alive and in the workforce in 2021 that are like, oh man, this laptop just doesn't look very, doesn't look professional enough. I can't believe there's a red I logo mean, on that. They can't, you can't have that here. What? Yeah. <laughs> like the lid is the lid is red or something like who who, who cares i desperately want I, mean, I desperately want the blue uh surface laptop <laughs> if it wasn't right, that like, if it wasn't that texture wrong, i'd be but that's what's issue. wrong with what's wrong with a splash of color what's wrong yeah. with rgb like who 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 cares life is so little it's life is so short just let people have their RGB. Let them bring it to work. Like, what? What is the big deal? Yeah, because it doesn't. No, I mean, affect I anything. get it. There's, there's probably some somebody out there who still thinks that way, but they need to get with it. I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, what do they think? Someone is going to an investor or some big wig of the company is going to walk by, see someone with an Alienware head logo, and say, "Oh, your people aren't working. They're playing games." Well, anyone who's so ignorant that they don't realize that a computer is a computer and it can play games or not uh, at any given time, I don't know what to do for them. It, I mean, so anyway, I, I, I get around to this to say, like, does Discord really have to change their logo? Does, you know, what what does it even mean? Like, if, if it's a good tool for the job, it's a good tool for the job. Right, exactly. And I don't know, it's all... It's all very strange. I'm okay with the idea that they're that they're kind of reaching outside of their their bubble because outside of their bubble is reaching in and and that makes sense. I think that the branding change is weird. Um, I think that bringing more brightness into the brand is a good idea because I have always hated the dark nature of their application. Uh, but I mean, outside of that, uh, I don't know. It, it's it's all very strange to me. But it's also very strange to me that that things start as so so niche. But whatever, doesn't matter. This is where we are now. Welcome Discord to the very crowded marketplace of communications systems. This week's DRM not included in F5 Live is probably powered by Amazon Prime. You know you get free shipping, sometimes same day, but you may not know that you get uh, free music with Amazon Prime Music. You get free TV, movies, and documentaries with Amazon Prime Video. You get a free Twitch subscription and free video games with Amazon Prime Gaming and a whole lot more. We've got links to those uh, benefits, including some of the ones I didn't mention. We've got a 30-day free trial if you don't already have a subscription. 
and we have the ability to send it as a gift all in one place by going to f5live.tv slash prime. Now, one brand that has had its interesting ups and downs has been Beats. Uh, in the early days, when Monster was manufacturing the headphones, it seemed like you couldn't go anywhere without seeing people wearing Beats, uh, whether it be the, the full headphone to the in-ears after Monster left. Uh, it seemed to decline in usage since Apple's purchase in uh, 2014. 2014, um, it seems to have declined, continued to decline as Apple seems to put more focus on their own headphones uh, versus the headphones with another one of their brands on it, which has all been very strange. But Apple has signified that they are putting some more emphasis back onto the Beats brand uh, by bringing in an iconic Android designer. Uh, in fact, uh, Scott Coyle, Croyal with an R, uh, who is now going to be overseeing the Beats brand for Apple, um, designed one of the more iconic Android devices, the the HTC One, which became known as the M7 later, um, and the M8, uh, which were so popular that they ended up doing a variant for Windows Phone, um, and after that, ended up uh, being the co-founder of another uh, Android phone manufacturer whose design was very unique and very uh, kind of in-your-face. And so uh, bringing him in, I think, signifies that Apple wants to put more emphasis back onto the brand, especially when you take into consideration that while Croyle was doing the designs for HTC for the one M7 and M8, HTC owned a hefty percentage of Beats and had uh, Beats technology in those devices. So he's already familiar with working on the brand and uh, and he's a talented designer. I think Apple's serious about doing something with Beats again. What do you think, Abram? Yeah, why not? I mean, they... They invest a lot of money to buy to buy this company. Mm -hmm. They might as well invest. I mean, it's not like they don't have the money to make it a, to to keep it a success. And so, you know, they sh they should absolutely look at what Beats was doing in its heyday. Um, I find something interesting. Beats is still um, I don't know exactly what the financial relationship is. Beats is still known officially as Beats by Dre. Mm -hmm. It's not Apple Beats. Correct. It's Beats by Dr. Dre. Yes. Like, so, uh, so interesting, even though, you know, even though it's an Apple, Apple company now, they still are, they're still using, they're still using the affiliation with Dr. Dre. Yeah. And so. in fairness, that is, has always been the brand name, even when it was under the, yeah. under the monster umbrella, it was still Beats by Dre. Um, the, the idea was to find a big name to uh, to put their name on something that Monster was building. Things got out of control, but that's a whole different issue. Uh. Yeah. I mean, you, you gotta, I mean, you have to hand it to though this, I mean, I don't, I honestly don't know like what Dr. Dre's day-to-day -day involvement is with Beats or, or was at the time, but you have to, you have to hand it to him for picking a, picking a, picking a winner because if you look at some of the other brands that have been kind of built on equity of associating with a celebrity soul, uh, you know, uh, anything that will, I am touched, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, having Ashton Kutcher be the creative director for Lenovo, um, having Alicia Keys be the creative director for Blackberry and carrying uh, an iPhone, probably the worst one. Yes, probably the worst one. Uh, you know, all this like, hey, we're going to get a celebrity to be our, our brand. This is the one example I can think of where this and George Foreman Grills are maybe the two examples I can think where it really worked out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, in the early days, I know that that Noli and, and Dre, you know, 
worked together on on the early headphones because you know Dre wanted to be involved in tuning it because the original idea was that they would be studio headphones and that stopped being the case after a while. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I don't think I don't think he or Ives are involved in the brand at all anymore. I thought I had two ideas when when Apple bought bought Beats and neither one of them had to do with the headphones. Uh, one, I thought that the company had purchased its next CEO. Um, I thought that Ives was going to replace Tim Cook when Tim Cook was tanking the company. But then Cook got his head out of the sand and turned, started to turn things around and started to act more like, like Jobs did. Um, and I also thought, and I still believe, that a big part of that purchase was purchasing Beats Music um, because they quickly purchased contracts for streaming uh, and Beats Music. I mean, right down to the fact that the color scheme inside of Apple Music has not changed. It's still uh, the Beats Pink. Um, uh, Apple Music is Beats Music underneath. 100% it is the old. I mean, they've redone the, the UI, but when it launched, it was the Beats Music UI with Apple's icon on it instead. I think that had a lot to do with the purchase because they wanted to compete with Spotify and it was easier to purchase existing streaming rights than to go and negotiate them themselves. But, you know, Apple has gotten back into, I mean, think back before the AirPods. What was everybody's impression of Apple headphones? (laughs) First thing I know, I know when I was at Radio Shack, the first thing we would do with customers who bought iPhones was they would get monster built beats headphones because everybody hated the apple earbuds so yeah before now na- before now putting an apple logo on headphones was a kiss of death um so it made sense for them to bring in an existing successful brand but then they've just let it languish so you know maybe maybe we'll see more out of it maybe we'll see uh beats you know, Phoenix a little bit. Uh, so, so the way it's going to work is that the existing uh, design firm, Ammunition, is going to continue to be the design firm for Beats. Uh, they've been around on the brand for a very long time, uh, and Croyle is going to be the voice of Apple in that relationship, which seems like a really good idea. Let the team that's been designing Beats uh, making the design continue down that path and let this guy be the voice of Apple, you know, steady hand. He's got an idea of where the brand should go. Cause he's been involved in it for many years. So I think this is, I think this is a good move for Apple. Um, but whether or not it's too late to, uh, to revive the name, that is what we will find out. Well, that is our show. Thank you to those of you who joined us live. We always appreciate it. If you didn't and would like to in the future, Sunday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, you can go to f5live.tv slash join us. Um, if you're not able to join us live, that's okay. Plugitslive.com slash subscribe will show you all of our shows, including, as I mentioned at the top of the show, First Looks, which uh, currently has the first of several uh, conversations with Dean Kamen, the founder of of First Robotics, um, Segway Scooters, created the Coca-Cola Freestyle Machine, the Auto Syringe. He's he's a fascinating guy. It was a 30-minute conversation with a student, and it was really interesting. We've got another one coming up this week with myself and Danielle. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. So check that out uh, all at plugitslive.com slash subscribe. Um, next weekend is going to be a little weird. Uh, I don't entirely know what the plan is going to be. But the first Lego League Florida State Championships are next weekend. And Michelle and I are uh, producing on the technical side. So um, we might end up doing a condensed show on Sunday. We might end up doing maybe having to push it to Monday. Avram and I will talk about what that ends up looking like uh, as soon as we come off the air. So uh, watch for that on on social media. Facebook will probably be your best place to go to follow that. And definitely, if you're on Twitch with us, uh, we're going to be broadcasting the first LEGO League uh, State Championships on our Twitch channel. So 
check that out too. It'll be a lot of fun. It's all done in a VR platform. So I can't wait to see how all that works. Uh, but I guess with that, on behalf of the staff that's not here, I'm Scott. I'm Abram. And we will see you back next time. Ciao. Hello YouTube! Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of F5 Live Refreshing Technology. If you did, please uh, subscribe to the channel down below, and of course hit the notification bell because we know that subscriptions don't mean much on YouTube anymore. Uh, if you've got topics that you'd like us to talk about in the future, please uh, comment them down below. And if you'd like to not follow us on YouTube, there's lots of ways that you can follow along with our content by going to plughitslive.com slash subscribe. There you'll see all of our shows and all of the ways that you can watch, listen, and follow along.